Now this is uh, February 15th, uh, week seven, medical terminology. And uh, what are we doing? The musculoskeletal system. Now, this is a really nice chapter because you're gonna, you're gonna use this specific skill set, these specific words uh, for your future anatomy and physiology uh, uh, courses uh, and anything related to, you know, uh, because there's a lot of, there's a lot of skeletons, there's a lot of muscles and for your future training, <clears throat> and I can show you where, how this is useful for, uh, you know, for other classes. So let us now go into the textbook. And of course, I'm in the wrong. Okay. MED 120 and the Medical Language Laboratory. And then we're gonna go right into our ebook. And that, table of contents, we're gonna go into musculoskeletal, which is chapter 10. Okay, so of course, uh, uh, just like uh, uh, the other chapters, it starts off with who are, who are the people in our neighborhood. And there's two departments of uh, worth regarding when we're talking about musculo, musculoskeletal issues is first is the surgical service is uh, the department of orthopedics. If you look at the word, uh, the prefix ortho means to straighten, peds of course, uh, to walk or, you know, if all anyone who, uh, who've ever had any broken bones, knows that you don't walk too well, you don't move around too well uh, if your bones or your feet especially aren't ortho, aren't straightened out, okay? And uh, a lot of the musculoskeletal disorders, they're dealt with, you know, using modalities like pins and, and a lot of carpentry, uh, essentially, uh, pins and rods and, and that kind of thing. And that's, and that's a surgical service, that's orthopedics. But your joints, joints are typically treated uh, medically until it's uh, like my joints so far gone that we're going to have to do some surgery. And um, that's the department of rheumatology. Rheumatology is a subspecialty of um, the department of internal medicine. And these people are um, experts at um, uh, things that deal with the types, different types of uh, arthritis, uh, arthritis which is, you know, there's multiple types of arthritis, osteoarthritis and rheumatoid arthritis. Arthur means, of course, uh, uh, the, the word, the root word, um, uh, joint. And joint is any space in between two bones. Chiropractic medicine, they're not MDs. Orthopedics and rheumatology, they're MDs, but chiropractic medicine, even though they call them doctors, uh, I got a good friend of mine, Dr. John. Um, um, he's in uh, chiropractic medicine. What they do is they utilize um, like stretching and um, uh, different like uh, uh, postures and modalities, including heat, and uh, to straighten it and align your spine and align your um, musculoskeletal system. Because chiropractic medicine states that there's a lot of issues in the human body that have to, that directly link themselves to musculoskeletal disorders. And, um, and of course, since they're not MDs, they can't do drugs, they can't do surgery, but they can order um, with a special license, they can order the x-rays. But typically, uh, the people who read the x-rays is the Department of Radiology, right? Uh, they get but uh, uh, chiropractic medicine, they have training where they, um, where they can read the x-rays and the CT scans. Um, and by that, then they can, you know, uh, have a plan, you know, for the different kinds of stretching and the different kinds of, uh, you know, um, body movements. Um, chiropractic medicine works a lot with physical therapy and occupational therapy. Um, and, and also, so does, of course, orthopedics and rheumatology. And remember, 
uh, chiro, um, um, occupational and physical therapy, their function is to utilize the modalities of uh, heat and cold and, and stretching and exercise to get back the patient's uh, muscles and joints and bones, uh, you know, back to uh, working order. So if you look at, this is a typical thing that you'd see for those of you who've already taken anatomy and physiology, this is the uh, typical thing that you see, but you could see how there are certain muscles that are named after their shape. And knowing um, uh, the medical term that's for shape. So for example, your delta. A delta is a triangle. Use your imagination a little bit. Here's one side, here's another side, here's the third side. So oid means resembling. So that triangular muscle on your shoulder, that's called your deltoid. You have also a trapezoid here. Here's like a one side, here's another side, here's another side, and here's another side. And a trapezoid, if you remember that from, um, you know, from high school geometry, looks like that. Kind of like a squished um, rectangle. Well, that's what this thing looks like. You also have um, your rhomboidus, which is also in your back. So that's a trapezoid. How does a rhomboid look like? And here's your rhomboidus. Looks like uh, also a flat. Looks like this. And that's one of your uh, uh, muscles that are inside here, inside your back. So if you look at the word oid, or the suffix oid, <coughs> means resembling. So you have your deltoid, you have your trapezius here, and you have your rhomboid muscles uh, uh, that are deeper inside here. Another thing you, um, you can use to identify muscles is the number. So you have your biceps here, and there's two of them, one, two, and you have your triceps here, and they only showed like two of them here, but there's, uh, there's three of them actually. And sep means head, like cephalic means head. So tricep means there's three heads or three bellies or three parts of the muscle. And biceps means two. You have quadriceps, and you can uh, fathom a guess on what that means. The quadricep muscles, which is the um, uh, uh, largest set of muscles that you have in your body, that's on your, um, your thigh, all your thigh muscles. Another, uh, another clue on muscles is you got big muscles and little muscles. So you have your gluteus maximus here, max, because it's the bigger muscle. Then you have a medius and minimus, and those are the, the smaller muscles. You could also have, oh, here's another biceps here, one and two. And your biceps uh, brachii, right? Brachii means upper arm, right? So your brachialis and brachioradialis, and your, uh, they also belong and connected to your upper arm. Ooh, another one here is uh, another shape. Your eyes and your mouth have round muscles around them, like an orb. So you have your orbicularis oculi and your orbicularis oris. Oris, of course, looks, sounds like oral, mouth, oculi, right? Oculus means eyeball. Uh, what else can we see? Gasocnemius. Oh, direction. You can have your rectus abdominis here. Rectus means straight, straight muscles in your abdomen. You have your obliques here, which go diagonally, okay? And here's another example of big muscle versus little muscle. You have your pectoralis major, and there's minor muscles underneath it. So you could see, just by this quick demonstration, that you could, you could try to memorize all of these from memory, but remember, it's not English. Uh, but if you understand that all of the names come from medical terminology sources, then you could pretty much figure out a, a lot of the muscles and uh, bones in your body. So let's look at some more examples. Now, if you look at the muscle, it has some covering and, or if you uh, recall, um, when's the last time you ate chicken, right? And if you know chicken has a skin and then the skin has, there's another skin underneath it and then other skin underneath it covers, you know, the meat of the chicken, right? Uh, which is the actual muscle. 
and then it goes into the, that covering goes into like a, a tendon like this. And a tendon is something that connects muscle to bone. Well, that covering is called your fascia. And if you get injured, right, then you have to perform some sort of surgical repair. Fascioplasty is that repair. Uh, a lot of muscles can also get a, um, a tumor of fibrous tissue, fiber, so you can get a fibroma. You have um, two types of, well, there's actually three types of muscle. So let's look at those three types of words. You have three types of muscle, um, uh, striated or skeletal, you have smooth, also known as visceral, or the guts, right? And then of course, this is the easy one, cardiac, which is hard. Now the striated muscles, let's make this a little bit bigger, let's see this a little bit better on your screen. Now the striated muscles, their root is called rhabdo. So if you had rhabdomyositis, that is inflammation and infection of your striated or skeletal muscles. They call them striated muscles because if you look at them on an electron micro, not electron microscope, but um, you know, uh, a microscope, they look striped or striated. They have striations or stripes. Now they called smooth muscle because, uh, and these are muscles, of course, you control. Now your smooth or your visceral muscles, those are the ones lining your insides, your gastrointestinal tract. And those are the guts. And those smooth muscles are involuntary. And of course, the cardiac, of course, is involuntary as well. Okay? So the only muscles that you really can control physically are your striated skeletal muscles. So if I have an inflammation or infection of that, I have rhabdomyositis. And uh, typically you get rhabdo, um, let's say you work out too hard and uh, you burn out your muscles, that's one way to do it. Now, smooth is lyomyo. So if we look at that word, where is it here? I could have a smooth muscle, uh, hold up, I have to close the door. Okay, I'm back. So, rhabdo, think of um, uh, striated muscle, Cardiac, of course, or myocardial, we already know that word. But smooth muscle is lyo, lyo myo, to be exact. Smooth muscle. Myo means muscle, as we can see here. So a lyomyoma is a tumor of your smooth muscle. You could also have a, a, a rhabdo, a rhabdomyoma, which is a little bit rare. And um, um, yeah, I don't want to add to that. I don't want to get into a... Uh, pathologic discussion. Lumbocostal, that's pertaining to the loins in the lower back. So the lumbar area and the costal area, which is, uh, you know, um, around the area of your rib cage. And this is around the area of your loin. So around this area will be your lumbocostal area. Muscular, of course, AR pertaining to muscle. Myorexis, uh, remember I mentioned rhabdomyositis? Uh, that's one of the signs and symptoms of um, a rhabdo, rhabdomyositis when you work out too hard. You're gonna have, you might have a rupture uh, uh, of some of the muscles and a breakdown, uh, which is lysis. So you might have myolysis. Rupture is myorexis. Remember we just mentioned the tendon? That is the band of uh, connective tissue from your, uh, the covering, which is your fascia of the muscle to the bone. And sometimes we have to cut into that if it's damaged, and that's called the tenotomy. Then we perform a tendoplasty. So I cut into it, getting away all the damaged parts, then I sew it back up and uh, repair it. And, but typically we all get like uh, stuff like uh, tendonitis, inflammation infection of your tendon. Those of you who have that, it's, it's kind of painful. And uh, can't move around too much. 
suffixes or the ends of the words, pain, myalgia, right? Uh, so maybe you've heard on TV, fibromyalgia, that's pain in your muscles due to, due to some uh, abnormal fibers. Myasthenia, you may have heard of myasthenia gravis, which is a uh, myo, meaning muscle. Asthenia, which is weakness, that's a progressive weakness. Um, a classic uh, situation of a myasthenia gravis patient, um, I had a classmate who, he woke up, fun, felt funny, we went to AM lecture, and then he knew something was wrong, so he tried to get back to his apartment. By 9.30, he tried to flag down a cab, and then he wasn't able to even lift his arms to get a cab, and then he, he was so weak that he, he like kind of uh, fell down in front of our emergency room. Fortunately for him, you know, our medical school was associated with a, uh, with a hospital. And uh, by 11.30, quarter to 12, he was hooked up to a mechanical ventilator because he no longer could breathe on his own. So you could see how myasthenia gravis, a weakness or debility, debility of your muscles can even affect your muscles that control your breathing. So it can get kind of dangerous. Uh, myopathy, of course, any disease, uh, um, any disease process that deals with your uh, muscles. So if you have a cardiomyopathy, that means you have a cardiac muscle problem. Um, and uh, let's look at this one. Paralysis, plesia, hemiple hemiplegia, paraplegia. You've heard those terms before. So if you look at the word paralysis, Lysis means breakdown. Para means alongside. You know, what does that mean? If you look at this picture, this picture here, All right, I'm back. Sorry about that. I was trying to mute out. Now, if you look at this, if you look at this picture. Whoa, whoa, it's too big. If you look at this picture, this is your spinal cord, and these are your spinal nerves that come out of your spinal cord. Now, when we're looking at the word paralysis or paralysis, lysis means breakdown alongside of. So if I took a knife and I ran it alongside the spinal cord, there will be no signals going up or down. That means I won't be able to feel anything and I won't be able to move anything. So that's what paralysis is. And the medical uh, suffix is plagia. So hemiplegia means paralysis of uh, one side of the body. So what, was that look, what would that look like? If you look at hemiplegia, here's like, uh, right? You could have one half, right? Diplegia, of course, di means two. You could have the lower half. Quadriplegia, one, two, three, four limbs, all four limbs, okay? And this will, what will happen if there's paralysis or something happened to those spinal nerves and the spinal, and the spinal column, okay? So, plesia, paralysis, hemiplegia, paraplegia, monoplegia, uh, quadriplegia, those are examples. Raffi, myorophy. Remember we talked about that uh, tendoplasty? If I'm doing a, uh, if I'm trying to patch up uh, your tendon, odds are you messed up your uh, muscle as well. So I got to suture that, uh, that as well. And that's a myorophy and that's suturing of a muscle. Sarcoma, that's bad news. Um, a myosarcoma, like a rhabdomyosarcoma, that's bad news. That's a malignant tissue tumor of muscles. This is, I remember, sarcoma are highly malignant, meaning to say is they grow very fast, they grow very big, and they like to metastasize or move around, which is never a good thing in the, in the, world, of, um, uh, in the world of cancer, okay? Another thing that's important about uh, orthopedics is when your patient comes in 
and then they talk about what they can and can't do. Uh, part of our job is to document that. And the only way to know how to document it is knowing what the emotions look like. So if you look at this, she's flexing her arm. But the angle here, you could see, it starts off at 180, goes to 90, and then goes less than 90. So that means the, this angle right here in her elbow, as she's flexing her arm, she's decreasing the angle of the joint. And when she does the exact opposite, she's extending her arm all the way out to 180 degrees. And that am angle is also known as your ROM or range of motion. Okay, so if my patient has arthritis or they're recovering from an injury, um, we take this uh, little protractor and it's called a goniometer. Picture of it. It's just like that. And then we, you know, you put it by the patient's joint when they, when they can uh, flex it or they move as best as they could. And then we document that ROM or that range of motion with an angle. See, and that's all it is. It's just like a big, big plastic uh, protractor. And that's called a goniometer. So goniometer could, uh, in, uh, could, uh, could measure the angle of flexion or the angle of extension. You could also have adduction and abduction. Now, uh, when, you look at, when you look at these pair of terms, and remember, if you have two pairs of terms, you memorize one like your life depended on it, and the other one is simply the other. If you see abduction, what do you do when you abduct somebody? You do what? You take them away from something. So look at the patient via midline, and if they're performing abduction, they're moving their limb, whether it be the arm or their leg, away from midline. So abduction is away from midline. And what is the exact opposite? Adduction, you're adding the limb back to midline. Rotation is easy, right? You can have a, a medial or lateral rotation. Medial means towards your middle, lateral is towards the outside world. Pronation and supination. Uh, um, pronation is how you place your palms down on a table. Supination is the exact opposite. And um, if you have any potential movement disorder, or maybe you've been in an accident, uh, or maybe uh, you're being tested to see how's your blood alcohol level, um, um, the police officer or the people in the emergency room might make you want to do patty cake. You know, put your uh, hands down. Uh, uh, so pronation means putting your palm down. Supination is the exact opposite. That's when you play patty cake. Uh, and that's part of your neurologic mini uh, mental assessment exam. You'll learn that in future training. Those of you ladies who love the um, uh, your high heels, or maybe, I don't know, what the guys are in this class are into. Maybe you like wearing your high heels. I know I do. Eversion. That's when you, uh, movement of the uh, foot outward. So this person like kind of sprained their ankle or twisted their ankle with the movement going away or outward or laterally. Later means the side. Now, when you have it medially, that's called inversion, okay? That's an inversion uh, injury versus an eversion. Dorsiflexion and plantar flexion, you need to know know and understand these terms for things like your reflexes, for example, your uh, Babinski plantar. And this is how I remember it. Plant, you plant your feet into the ground. And then the other, the other way is the exact opposite. And dorsum, they, this is called the dorsum of your foot. So that's dorsiflexion. And you force down here, that is plantar flexion. So these are, these are must know things. This will, this will, if this doesn't come out on, the, on your final, it'll definitely come out in other exams and other things. This is your um, uh, appendicular uh, skeletal system, all the ones in this grayish blue. So it has anything to do with your shoulder girdle. Um, now, you don't really need to know all your bones in, uh, for your final for this particular class. But hey, if you've never had anatomy and physiology before, what, what would be a smart thing to start looking at these and knowing the names of all of these. Uh, the one thing I have to mention is phalanges. 
is toes with toes and fingers. So phalanges upper extremity means your uh, bones and your fingers and the phalanges lower extremity means your toes. And the way we label them is some side is number one, two, three, four, five. And um, um, big toe side is one, two, three, four, five. So if I injured my, <coughs> my left middle finger, I would say there was a fracture of my patient's phalanges, uh, number three, upper extremity. That's how, that's how we would know. All right, and your skull, your spinal cord, your rib cage, right? And this is your, um, your vertebral column here. Um, they are part of your axial skeletal system. Axis, like a top, right? And then appendicular, your appendages, like your arms and legs. Now, you have a shoulder girdle here. You also have a pelvic girdle here. And the reason why they call it a girdle because you know what a girdle does. It's support and it wraps around things. And here, your, your clavicle and your scapula and, and uh, um, uh, the glenoid epiphysis of your humerus right here is, forms that. And here, it's your acetabulum, which is the ball and socket joint of your femur connecting to your, uh, your ilium and your uh, ischium, which is part of your hips. So you may have heard of carpal tunnel syndrome. So carpals are the bones of your wrist. And if the tendon in your, uh, that comprises, um, that makes this tunnel that's in your wrist collapses, it uh, impinges upon your median and sometimes uh, uh, ulnar nerves. And then your, your wrist might drop and have a weakness. And that's called carpotosis. So tosis means a prolapse or a drop or a downward displacement uh, uh, of your hand. Cervical means pertaining to your neck. And there's two necks. You could mean your neck in uh, your, of course, your neck neck of your bones, or you could mean your cervix, which is in your genital urinary tract of female, right? If you look here, there's a, like a slimming right here. So this is your um, uterus, right? Or your, uh, the female womb. And then you could see there's a narrowing here, like a little neck. And that's also called a cervix too. So if we're talking cervical cancer in the genital urinary tract, we're talking about this. If I'm talking about um, uh, a cervical displacement or a cervical problem in my, in my musculoskeletal, I'm most likely talking about the cervical vertebrae in my neck. And cervix means essentially neck. Costo rib, so you have uh, an area underneath the ribs, subcostal. You have an area above the ribs, supracostal. You have an area in between the ribs, intercostal. And the intercostal spaces, they're really important for uh, uh, clinical pulmonology purposes and also EKG, where you have to measure up where you put the electrodes on. And that's your intercostal space or ICS or the space in between your uh, ribs. Cranium, of course, is your skull cap. So if I'm porting, performing a craniotomy, um, I poke a hole or drill a hole in your skull to alleviate uh, intracranial pressure because you know your brain is surrounded by fluid. And if I bash my skull and get either too much fluid or too much blood, it'll have undue pressure on my brain and might turn my brain off. And that's dangerous because you turn your brain off, it will turn off your breathing and your heart rate as well. So increased intra intracranial pressure can be resolved using craniotomy, and that's when we actually take a drill and drill a hole in your head. Humerus, or your funny bone, your upper arm, right? Humeral, pertaining to your upper arm. You have uh, carpals, which is your, um, your wrist, but your metacarpals is like the back of your hand, also known as your dorsum of your hand. And tarsal means your ankle. So metatarsal means the dorsum of your foot. Phalanges we already mentioned. Vertebrae, the bones in back of your backbone. 
And if you look at your vertebrae, like this one, ooh, whoa, uh, made it too big. Okay, here we go. You have the ones near your neck, that's the cervical, the ones that are affiliated with your 12 uh, ribs, and that's your thoracic, the ones in your loin area, lumbar, and of course, sacral, and at the very area end, you have your coccyx. And this is your vertebrae. And if you look here on the top view, you could see that's where your spinal cord. So whoever built us, built a nice little protection here. And then you have your intervertebral discs, which are made out of uh, cartilage, as, and they use, utilize as a nice shock absorber for uh, this vertebrae right here. So vertebrae, I can have inflammation or infection of the vertebrae, and that's called spondylitis. And these are, those are examples of my vertebral column. Sternocostal, pertaining to the sternum and your ribs, okay? Uh, ribs one through seven are called true ribs because they connect, they have sternocostal connections, or connections from the ribs to your sternum, also known as your breastbone. Your heel of your foot is called your calcaneum and you could have calcanodynia. Uh, uh, I had a good friend of mine, we were wrestling together. He was limping all throughout the week. Uh, he had a fracture of his heel bone. He was just walking around with it. He even went to a meet uh, with a, a, a fractured heel bone. Femur, femoral, uh, it takes a lot to fracture your thigh bone. You gotta be hit like by a truck or something like a, like a UPS truck or something like that because it's the biggest, thickest, and strongest bone in your body, and it's covered by your largest muscle group, your quadriceps. So the odds of it really, really shattering into a million pieces, unless you've been shot. That also goes to show you the amount of force that a bullet has versus a truck. I'd rather get hit by a truck than a bullet, uh, medically and, and physically, no lie. Fibular, AR pertaining to your fibula. Now, you also have your tibia. So let's look at a skeleton because uh, easier to look at. If you look at here, these are the bones of your lower leg, tib, fib. Your tibia is the bigger, stronger one, you know, your shin bone, the one in the front, and your fibula is the one in the back. And if you break this, your tibia, odds are you're gonna also break the fibula behind it. And that is called a tib-fib fracture. Uh, ankylosis, um, that's abnormal osis, stiffening or bent or crooked. Uh, and we always, always talk about ankylosis. Uh, we talk about that regarding your vertebrae. So you can have ankylosing spondylitis. Arthritis, remember what the rheumatologists are really good at. Itis, inflammation or infection of the joint space in between two bones. And the arthritis, it could be anything. Some of them are, um, are autoimmune in nature, like osteo, uh, osteoarthritis and rheumatoid. Um, others are metabolic in nature, like um, uh, gout, because, uh, you know, if you get build up, um, uh, uric acid crystals in your joint space, it gets really, really painful. Costochondritis, inflammation and infection of your ribs and the cartilage. So there's, uh, if you noticed, let's take a look at some ribs. If you look here, this is, all this brown stuff is bone. Why did they put that there? You know, I didn't eat yet. That's cruel. Then you have this cartilage here. Now, if you see ribs seven, one through seven, they connect into your sternum right here. Here's your corpus and here's the manubrium sterni and this is your um, xiphoid process. You see that you need this cartilage to be a little bit flexible so that when my patient breathes in and out, the rib cage can expand and contract with it just a little bit just enough so you can breathe. Okay, uh, orthopedics we already went over. I'm skipping, let's go back to this. 
lamina, laminectomy. Let's look at the parts of vertebra. Let's look at this thing. The lamina are these curved parts right here. Now, if you recall the picture that we saw before, you have your spinal cord in here, and then you have, oh, not spinal cord, yeah, you, you have your spinal cord in here, and then you have spinal nerves that come out. Sometimes this lamina, uh, like, interferes with that, so we got to cut it out, cut this piece out, so that it doesn't impinge or doesn't squeeze on, um, um, on that um, spinal nerve that's coming out. And here we're going to be looking at a slipped disc. This is your intervertebral disc, the cartilage in between two uh, vertebrae. Okay. I'm going to talk about that in a moment. Uh, myelocele, myelo could be in bone marrow or spinal cord, depending on uh, uh, what context you're talking about. Ortho means straight. We already talked about orthopedics, straightening of the foot or child, but uh, it's a straightening of uh, all bones and joints in general. Bone, of course, osteo. So if I have a, a inflammation or infection of this living, breathing thing called bone, that's osteo, uh, osteoitis. If I have a, um, a really, really malignant fleshy tissue tumor, I will have osteosarcoma. A nice example is Ewing's, which is really nasty. Uh, usually affects the knee, adolescent boys, not pleasant. Osteoclasts, osteoblast, and osteocyte. Let's look at those three words. Now, if you look at the word blast, that suffix blast, it means it's a precursor cell or an immature cell. So it's just growing. Osteocyte is the mature bone cell. Now what's an osteoclast? Think clast, this cell breaks down. Now, when you're much younger, this turnaround of osteocyte then gets broken down by osteoclast, then gets replaced by osteoblast, and then back to osteocyte. That is called um, uh, remodeling. That's why when you're a kid, you could take a really nasty fall and you'd be fine and just go inside and just dust yourself off. And that is also for those of us who are a little bit older, right? You fall out of your car, then you might need to call the ambulance. So this is called remodeling, the cycling of immature bone cells to mature bone cells and osteoclast breaks down these um, uh, either damaged or older mature bone cells. And that's called remodeling. Okay, and that's why your bones are stronger than steel because steel, when I bend it or break it, it doesn't repair itself. But here, our bones, human bones, they do, and that's why they have a greater tensile strength, tensile strength than um, actual steel because it's constantly remodeling itself. Um, here's some parts of the long bone. Eh, I don't need to know them, but I'm just going to go over. Uh, briefly so that if you're in anatomy and physiology, you have a nice little review. This number one here, that's the shaft, also known as the diaphysis. If you recall, dia, the prefix dia means complete or thorough. So that's the complete, you know, uh, main section of the bone. If you look at bone, you have also the ends, and those are called epiphysis because epi means on top of or most superficial. Now, if you look on the epiphysis, epiphysis right here, you'll see that there is cartilage. And this one, the cartilage got removed, but there'll be cartilage down here on this epiphysis as well. And that's in order to facilitate motion and decrease friction. You'll see here you have trabecular uh, bone, and then it's going to have red and, um, red and yellow bone marrow inside. There's arteries, veins, and nerves inside. You have an inner lining called your endosteum, and then you have your outer lining called your periosteum, just right here. So this is a nice thing to look at for anatomy. But if you want to talk about 
bone parts. Think about it. Peri, meaning outside. Endo, inside. Diaphysis, full shaft of the, uh, of the bone. Epiphysis, epi, on top of their ends. Here's arthroscopy. And you can see where we need three holes. One for the actual instrument, one for a viewing scope, and one for uh, irrigation. Now, that's much better than me slicing this whole thing open, and uh, recovery time would be in the, in the uh, weeks to months. But uh, arthroscopy well, is much, much quicker than that. Uh, let's see, hip replacement. Okay, here's nice. It's the uh, acetabulum cap we talked about. Here's the hips, and here's the damaged femur. Another uh, quiz example if you want to mess with that. Let us look at the types of broken bones. It could go straight across, and that's called transverse. If it goes diagonally, that's called oblique. But here, you see how it's breaking the skin? That is called an open fracture versus a closed fracture. You can also see how a closed fracture much, much better than having an open one uh, with respect to um, uh, what do you call that? Um, inflammation and infection, but uh, infection. That's the word I'm looking for. Let's, not, let's get the answers of these. Huh? See if they have answers because uh, impacted. Uh, all right. So let's look at these other ones. See this has all these bone fragments? That's called a comminuted fracture. That means it's all in pieces and this is very, very, of course, hard to heal. This one, this is again another transverse. Uh, dinner fork deformity or um, a fracture of your wrist is called colis, right? Of course, complete fracture is uh, goes right through incomplete is partial and a classic incomplete partial is this it's called green stick green stick fractures happen when um, the patient is typically five years and under and um, they uh, they only break on one side and the other side just bends kind of like a green stick you know when you you try to break a twig of a, a of a brand new uh, you know of a brand new tree it like bends on one side, but then breaks on the other. And that's what's called a green stick. So think green stick, think kid, usually under five years of age. Here's another, uh, here's another impacted fracture. Now typically impacted fractures or, or compression fractures, yeah, they happen here, but the more common ones are on your vertebrae. You know, like when you wanna jump out of a, jump out of a window to go kill yourself. By the way, you wanna go kill yourself? Hint, hint, don't jump out of a window. Uh, nine times out of ten, they kind of live. Uh, all the suicides that I had by jump, by jumping, I had like a dozen of them in my career when when I was in EMS. Um, by the way, all of them lived, um, um, and they all had varying heights of like two stories and up. So, let's now look at something else less gruesome, other than suicide. Here's the natural curvature of the spine we mentioned around the neck course cervical. Oh, I just noticed I have low battery. What's going on there? Plug ourselves in. Cervical of the neck, thoracic for your rib cage, lumbar or your loin, right? And then you have your fused sacrum and at the very end your coccyx or your tailbone. Let's see if there's nice other words. When are they going to go to the herniated disc? We'll go to that in a minute. Well, you know what? Why, why wait? Let's look at what the herniated disc looks like. A herniated intraventricular disc, also known as a nucleus uh, propulsus uh, herniation, this is what it looks like. Ooh, there. Now, typically, if you look at this one here and this interventricular disc here, you see how it's all neat, neatly stacked and it won't in interfere with either the, um, uh, uh, what's this thing called again? 
spinal cord and your spinal nerves. But if you see here, if the nucleus propulsus or the inside part of this intervertebral disc gets deformed and starts to stick out or starts to herniate, it'll pinch on this nerve. Hence the term, I got a pinched nerve, hence the term slip disc, right? So it could either form pain or numbness or both, depending on which part of uh, the spinal nerve that it's messing with. Here's another view. It's really nice. Ouchy. Right? This is what it's supposed to look like normally. And then when it presses against it, that's when it causes pain and, and, and or um, um, uh, numbness. AIDS, HIV. When you're looking at um, um, x-rays, AP view x-ray. So if you're looking at a, a x-ray, there's different views. And if you look at this, um, let's do radiologic. Uh, they're not going to give you x-ray views, maybe the word x-ray. Uh, no. All right. Let's do it just old school. You have AP and PA and LAT. LAT is L-A-T. So AP means anterior posterior. Now, what does that mean? It means that the x-ray beam is going from the anterior, which is the front, to the posterior. So AP means that the patient, the view of the beam is going from the front to the back. And PA view means the x-ray is going from the back to the front. And lat or lateral, that means uh, we're shooting uh, the view or we're shooting the x-rays from the side of the patient. So if I had an APPA view, I have two views. If I have APPA lat, I have three views. And there's other views, oblique and all these other things. But those are basic views regarding um, x-rays. DO, doctor of osteopathy. Now, they are closer to MDs than they are to, um, to chiropractors. DOs can, nowadays a modern DO does everything that the MD does. They can uh, prescribe medications, do minor surgeries. Um, but when, when osteopathy started, their main focus was on um, uh, pathologies of the bone. And they had similar um, like views, just like chiropractors had, that you know, if, you're, if your uh, spine is out of line, it causes a lot of other problems. And here's a classic, uh, classic thing that chiropractors and the original doctors of osteopathy thought. Like for example, if you're all slunched over, right, and you have poor posture, you're not going to sleep well, you're not going to move around well, and then it will be easier for you to get, uh, to get obese because you're not moving around well. So then all these other problems like hypertension and diabetes will kind of be linked to that. And that's what uh, DOs and chiropractors, that's how they see uh, um, the musculoskeletal system. They see it as a main point of integration with the, all the other systems. CT, a computerized uh, a tomography. Tomo means location, graphy means to record. So uh, CTs are, CTs shoot uh, multiple x-rays and then the computer um, uh, puts together, um, um, you know, all the views and, and, and then it produces something like this. You put all the views together and then you're gonna have multiple views of things. And it's the computer that's putting all the all the things together, and they they utilize um, uh, X-rays. Uh, I don't know whoever called carpal tunnel syndrome CTS. I've never seen that. And the only time I've ever seen that is in textbooks. Fracture is FX. Uh, HNP. No, they just say herniated disc. Now you see this C, L, S, and T. Well, remember we talked about that um, the cervical vertebrae are in your neck. There's seven of them. So you label them C1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. 
Lumbar, there are five of them. So you label them L1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Sacral, there are five fused, but they also have um, uh, five associated nerves with it. So they would call that sacral 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And thoracic, since there's 12, it'll be thoracic 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. Um, so if I have a T3 fracture, that means it's thoracic, third thoracic vertebrae fracture. If I had an L2, L4 fracture, that means from L2 through L3 through L4, that's uh, my lumbar, my second lumbar, third lumbar, and fourth lumbar uh, fracture. And remember, it's not vertebra, it's vertebrae when we're talking about multiple, uh, uh, multiple bones being involved. My myasthenic gravis we mentioned, muscular dystrophy. Dys means abnormal, troph means growth. So MD, you get that, uh, we start looking at that when uh, the child has a hard time walking or they get, they have these weird postures um, when they're a baby. That's why we, when in the baby, we're always looking for a lot of the milestones, like can they put their head up? How do they get up? When, when they roll over, can they roll over back by themselves? Uh, and that's the things we look for, especially things like MD. Myasthenia gravis, I mentioned that earlier. Uh, one of my classmates got it. It's autoimmune neuromuscular disorder. Severe muscular weakness, and it's progressive. That means it starts off in the beginning of the day just as an overall weakness, and then by mid-afternoon, you will not be able to breathe. You will not be able to move anything. Sprain versus strain. Now, a strain is an overstretching of your tendon, uh, a sprain is an overstretching of your ligament. Now, what does that mean? Tendon is, they both produce the same thing. Inflammation, and then uh, you can't move that joint very well. And it's, of course, within inflammation, you have pain, redness, swelling, heat, uh, all the five cardinal signs and symptoms. But a tendon, if you recall, tendon is the fascia that connects the muscle to the bone. And a ligament is um, the connective tissue that connects bone to bone. But so that's what a sprain is and that's what a strain is, but they both produce the same effects. Um, uh, immobility and pain, uh, if any of you ever had either one. So many times clinicians utilize these words um, interchangeably. Torticollis, uh, if you've ever had really bad stiff neck, maybe it's called wry neck, right? Uh, congenital, of course, you're born with it and acquired is if you have really poor posture. Bunyan, nice to know, contractures. Ooh, contractures. Remember, connective tissue and muscles, the function is to contract, get bigger and get smaller. But if you don't move them around, um, that's why you have to have physical therapy, especially if you're bedridden. You start having fibrosis and the contractures, it starts stiffening up all your, your muscles and your fascia and your tendons and your ligaments, and it gets really painful. Crepitation, it's that um, if any of you ever broke a bone, it's the sound made, that it makes. It's kind of like uh, you can hear the bones rubbing together. It's, and that's how we kind of know that you have a broken bone. You can kind of feel it and hear it. It's kind of like uh, a more snappy version of you cracking your knuckles. Ewing sarcoma, ganglion cyst, nice to know. Gout, we already mentioned. Herniated disc, we already talked about. Rheumatoid arthritis, rheumatoid. Oid, resembling rheumat, the fluid in your joint space. That means the fluid in your joint space, because it, it looks like it, but it doesn't really. It's when your, um, uh, your immune system starts attacking yourself. RA is not fun. Uh, I already have a little bit of it going down. Uh, club foot, eh, to, and it's pronounced Talipes equinovarus. Uh, oh, these are definitely good to know. Scoliosis is abnormal curvature of the spine. Kyphosis, also an abnormal curvature of the spine called uh, humpback. And lordosis is abnormal cur curvature of the spine. Uh, mostly in the lumbar area over here, and that's called lordosis or sway, uh, sway back. Sway back, hump back, and scoliosis is just, you know, uh, I don't know, just scoliosis. Um, 
Yo, I had this done to me. This is no bueno. Arthrocentesis. We already know centesis is a surgical puncture and then of our joint space. Now you know that we already talked about rheumatology that the joint space has fluid in it. And if it's dirty or has some problems, uh, we can tell a lot by that fluid uh, to the pathology of, of that joint space. But boy, that, that needle is big and it is painful. DEXA scan, uh, also known as dual energy X-ray absorb, absorb it, Absorptometry. I'm going to say that 10 times fast. I just call them DEXA scans. Now, DEXA scans, we like that. That's um, low energy, full body, and it's for the diagnosis of osteoporosis, which is, of course, very, very common uh, um, in older female patients, especially who, uh, who've had children. RF, a rheumatoid factor, that's how it's associated uh, with uh, uh, rheumatoid arthritis, of course. Uh, sequestrectomy, and eh, nice to know. Here's something you need to know. NSAID, very, very common for a lot of the uh, common uh, drug of choice for the arthritis. Uh, you're familiar with NSAIDs like ibuprofen and Tylenol, and they are non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. These are really nice for mild to semi-moderate pain and because they're non-addictive and overall they're relatively safe, unlike you know, taking steroids, which is not safe. Uh, every time we give steroids, we, we think two or three times before we do stuff. So remember, your future exam won't look like this. Oh, uh, what is an NSAID? What is a bone re reabsorption? What is a gold salt? It's not like that. Or uh, what's the suffix? What's the prefix? Gone are those days. What's the exam going to look like. So let's look at this radiologic report and give me a, uh, an example of our patient, Arthur Rexon. So Arthur Rexon had an AP lat view of his lumbar spine and the AP view of his sacrum to show displacement is L5S1, right? L5S1 has the intervertebral space, contains a slight shadowing and decreased density. And that's not good, it's bone. It's not supposed to be decreased density or if it has too much density, that's not good either. There's now a slight narrowing of the L3, L4, and L4, L5. Bilateral laminectomies appear to be have done, so he's status post bilateral laminectomy from L5 to S1. He has slight hypertrophic lipping. Now, what does that mean? Hypertrophic, hyper, too much, troph, glow, growth. And if you saw that, um, that slip disc, how it was like, like the lip or the edge was like peeling over, and that's what a hypertrophic, hypertrophic lipping looks like. Upper lumbar vertebral bodies is now seen, slight lipping in the uh, upper margin of the body of L4. Sacroiliac joint space are well-preserved, lateral views of the lumbosacral spine, taken with the spine in flexion and extension to show slight motion of all lumbar and all lumbosacral levels, which is relatively normal because you, you're supposed to have a little bit of movement. But what are the impressions of this radiologic report, right? And who did it? Uh, Dr. Meyerson. So what is Dr. Meyerson? He is a radiologist. So that's another question I could ask, right? His impression or his diagnosis, degenerative uh, IV disc disease, L5 to S1, now with uh, accompanying narrowing or stenosis of L3 to L4, L4 and L5. Slight motion of all of the lumbar and lumbosacral levels. So what kind of questions could I ask you, right? And here's some nice words, right? I could, ask, I, guess I could ask you, how many views were done, right? Oh, we had an AP view, lat view. He goes, what view of the sacrum did we have? Well, AP of sacrum. He goes, um, did, we take an, he goes, did we take an AP view of his lumbar, lateral view, both, neither? And of course, you could see here, it's both. And then I could ask you, was it L3, was it L4, was it L4, was it L5, right? I could ask you, any, I guess I could ask you any of these things. I could ask you, is hypertrophic lipping normal? Hyper means what? Too much, troph, too much growth. Also, anything degenerative, that's not good. It's gonna break down. I could also ask you, um, when was his laminectomy done? Was it done today, yesterday, or will it be a future plan? If you see here, bilateral laminectomies were done. I could ask you, which lamina? Left, right, both, neither. 
If it's bilateral, of course, it's both, okay? So you could see how, oh, looky here. You could see how you could take these questions down here and then make them multiple choice, hint, hint. You could do that as well. And if you look at this operative report, there's a happy guy, Mr. Chen, right? And I could ask you, who did the surgery? And you know from this chapter, it had to be uh, orthopedics. So Dr. Anderson is what? Orthopedic surgeon, right? And he's the one who wrote the operative report. What's the patient's name? Goes, um, uh, Mr. Chen, Mr. Chen Zhang. Now this gets tricky, especially with foreign national Chinese, uh, because uh, the first name is last and the last name is first. So, you know, be aware of that, um, especially when, uh, when you have a um, Chinese patient with a traditional name. Um, so that being said, I think that's it. Of course, here's all the words that you can have. And remember, just as uh, one more public service announcement, any case that's in, that's in any chapter, let's look at some of these chapters. So chapter three, four, even the chapters that we've done before, do you think I could get a case from that? Sure, let's look at integumentary. And you go down and you go in the very, very end where it says medical record activities. I hit that up and voila, there you go another case and here's the common words and here's some kind of questions that you could use to practice on how to figure this out uh, because that is what actually medical terminology and medical communication is someone's going to ask you about the report right the doctor doesn't have it uh, or the or the DNP doesn't have it all the time or at their fingertips or they can't read it on their phone it is your responsibility if they call you right to be able to look inside um, the computer, electronic medical records, or open the chart and look at it and be able to answer some very, you know, some, well, sometimes not so uh, easy questions, but uh, at this level, yes, very, very straightforward questions, but you need to know your medical terminology. So with that being said,